Recently, the International Criminal Court put out a release regarding plans to issue an arrest warrant for President al-Bashir of Sudan as soon as March 4th of this year, an action which would destabilize the entire Sudanese region and plunge Africa into even further chaos. In his February 11th webcast and other recent statements, Lyndon LaRouche made the point that the situation in Sudan is a British orchestrated operation and the actions by the ICC are only further aggravating the situation. LaRouche issued a call to disband the ICC because its policy towards Sudan is absolutely intolerable. The sovereignty of the nation of Sudan is on the line, and the livelihood of all of Africa is at stake. LaRouche stated that problems do exist in Sudan and in that region, but they are the result of outside operations which go back to British imperial policies at the end of the 19th century. The situation cannot be understood without knowing this history. Following Lincoln's victory over the British-backed Confederacy in the 1860s and the ensuing completion of America's transcontinental rail system, the American system spread like wildfire throughout the world, with governments from the Atlantic to the Indian and the Pacific Oceans embarking on a path of development and national sovereignty. The perspective was to break the control and destroy the influence of the British Empire throughout the world. In the late 1800s, Africa became a crucial battleground. Under the Republican government of Francis Sadi Carnot and Gabriel Hanato, there was a concerted effort to develop the African continent and connect it to the rest of Eurasia by land through rail. Sudan itself became the first nation to break from the British and achieve independence in Africa when in 1885 the patriotic Islamic forces assassinated General Charles Chinese Gordon, the British Governor General of Sudan, and drove the British out. This was a direct threat to British imperial interests. To this day, the mere mention of the defeat of Chinese Gordon and the ensuing fight for sovereignty drives them crazy. They were losing control. The defeat by Lincoln was the first blow, and the ensuing spread of the American system, the development of Russia, the development of Germany, of France, and now the loss of their favorite looting grounds in Africa was intolerable to British imperial interests. In a series of events leading to the orchestration of a period of world war from 1890 to 1945, the British Empire set out to crush and destroy this republican tendency, as documented in the LPAC feature 1932. In Africa, this policy shift was crucial. The British organized the assassination of French President Sadi Carnot and orchestrated the Dreyfus Affair, severing the French influence in Africa. Following the completion of the Suez Canal by the Egyptians, British and French debt collectors were sent in to run a huge financial swindle on the Egyptian government, tying them up in enormous amounts of false debt and bankrupting the entire nation. In 1898, after the defeat of Chinese Gordon, the British sent their butcher, Lord Kitchener, into Sudan to prevent economic development at all costs. In an all-out slaughter of over 40,000 Sudanese nationalists, Lord Kitchener reconquered Sudan and took it back from the French at Fashoda. The period of developing the nation building up its rail and irrigation systems and connecting it to the Eurasian continent was over. The British policy from 1898 onward in Sudan and the rest of Africa was to drive Africa back to conditions of mass slavery. Rail lines were never developed further inland. Rail basically went to the mines and back again. The policy was the same as that of Sykes-Picot in the Middle East prior to World War I. Divide Africa, pit nation against nation, grouping against grouping, and create the conditions of continual warfare and chaos. The intention was not to allow any kind of economic, infrastructural, or cultural development to take place in the region. To this day, Africa remains in such a backward state. 
However, if you look at the region of Sudan, you see that it has everything necessary to become a breadbasket for the entirety of Africa. Just take a look at its geographical location and at a few crucial topographic features. First of all, Sudan and Egypt, when taken together, are a strategic development corridor between Africa and the rest of Eurasia through the Middle East. This is a key area for the development of a system of rail from the Eurasian continent through the Suez Canal region to Africa. Secondly, you have the majority of the Nile River running through this region. Now that's a big river. In 1959, Sudan and Egypt reached a treaty agreement called the Full Utilization of Nile Waters Treaty to share the water usage of the Nile River between the two nations. 55 billion cubic meters apportioned to Egypt, and 18.5 billion to Sudan. However, this is not nearly enough water to support growing economies in Egypt or Sudan. Now in Egypt, we would need large terraforming and nuclear desalination projects to green the vast expanse of the Sahara and Arabian deserts. In Sudan, however, we find one of the most fertile and rich agricultural lands in the world. Only a little over 8% of its potential farm base is currently under cultivation. It has an annual potential photosynthesis of 25 grams per square meter per day in its vast expanse of land. Over 81 million hectares of land could be cultivated for farmland. Over 88 million hectares can be used for forestry and over 23 million hectares for pasture. That's enough land area to be able to feed all of Africa and end poverty there entirely. The question then is why hasn't this potential been harnessed and developed? Well, look back to where we began. The situation in Sudan with the ICC indictment of Bashir. What are the influences there? It is the British Empire which is controlling this situation. The creation of the ICC was directly due to the lobbying efforts of George Soros and his control of the Coalition for the International Criminal Court, an organization which directly funds and controls the activities of the ICC. Soros, the UK Foreign and Commonwealth Office, and the European Instrument for Democracy and Human Rights, a Soros Open Society affiliated organization, are the main sponsors of the activities of the ICC and are behind the current policy towards Bashir and Sudan. The efforts by the ICC to issue an arrest warrant to Bashir would destroy any kind of potential for Sudan to survive. It would destroy Sudan. It would devastate Egypt and all other nations dependent on Sudan for water. And it would further accelerate the genocide and the chaos in the rest of Africa. The British policy towards Africa and the British policy in Sudan to this very day presents us with a crucial question. What is the nature of man? Over the last hundred years and more, this has been the crux of the fight for the soul of Africa. Is man merely a beast and a slave who can be looted and starved to death? The question we must ask ourselves is are we going to stand for the destruction and the degradation of millions of people, which is precisely the intention of the ICC policy towards Sudan today? If we are truly serious about ending the chaos in Sudan and the Darfur region, then we must be truly serious about a policy of development for Sudan and the rest of Africa. We must get serious about solving the water crisis in the southern region of Sudan and in Egypt. We must get serious about solving the food crisis in the entirety of that continent. If we are truly serious about solving crimes against humanity, then we must put George Soros on trial for his crimes against humanity. The current Obama administration must not buy into the lies and the propaganda regarding Sudan. Instead, we must use the fight for the development of Africa and the fight against the British Empire in Africa as the crucial pivot to change the world. That kind of approach, a positive approach towards Africa, is the only kind of approach which will work. 
Our, in, our interest in Africa, our interest in parts of the world, is to not just to make friends. That's, that's a kind of a sloppy term. Our, our function as the United States, as we are a republic, our interest in the world is not to have any empires. We hate empires. We hate the British Empire, not only because, it, because of the crimes it commits and still commits, but we don't like empires. We believe in nation states. We believe in representative government, constitutional government, nation states. We believe in nation state building. We don't believe in globalization. We believe in nation state building. Globalization is an empire. We don't believe in empires. And therefore, our policy should be consistently to develop wherever we have the opportunity to assist in developing nation state building and dealing with problems such as food shortages, disease control, these kinds of things, practical measures. And the only time we go to war is when we have to defend something like that. And we fight only when that's necessary and only as far as that's necessary. We don't get involved with these imperial policies of, the t of this type.